All right, so I have now brought the data file into the RPT file, the report file, into my directory, and I'm launching Microsoft Excel so that I can look at the results that uh, I've exported from, uh, from uh, Abacus. And let's hope that this is a successful um, procedure. So I'm going to import that data file. into Excel. And I brought it into my desktop as a .rpt file. There it is. And then it's asking me, all right, do you want it to be, how do you want me to import it? Do you want me to break it up into columns? And I surely do. I surely want it broken up into columns. Um, of course, it's Excel, so half of the time it won't do what I want it to do. But it looks like it's got all the columns properly identified. So I'll say next and hope that it imports it properly. All right, so there's all the data that I obtained. Well, it's very interesting. Let's look at what we're, what we're seeing here. All right. So the first column seems to be X, which is time. And you can see that this is going in increments of 0.1. There are 10 increments and that's the end of the first step. So that's the first step of the analysis, all right? And that's the second step of the analysis. It starts off with one, and after about 100 increments, it ends up with two. So that's my second step of the analysis. It has imported both the data I could have if I wanted, taken only results from one part. <coughs> one step. <coughs> now, here's E11. Remember, I had stored the total strain, epsilon 1 and, one one and epsilon 2, 2. They're right there in these columns. This is the plastic strain PE11 and the PE22. That makes sense. This was that mysterious term PEEQ that we're going to talk about a little bit later. I'm going to cut it out and I'm going to leave it here so we can deal with it later. It's not going to be something we're going to be talking about immediately. There's the von Mises stress. Uh, we'll talk about that also a little bit later. So I'll cut it out and move it to a little bit later. So now we're looking at E11, E22, PE11, PE22, and the two stresses S11 and S22. These were the two that we pulled out. This is the actual results associated from that element. And it's telling us that it is from element number 75 at integration point number one. There was only one integration point. So that information is useful. So here I am looking at S11 and S22. And I know that these are the principal stresses. So if I wanted to check whether yielding has occurred, then I would calculate the yield stress, assuming that these two are the principal stresses, which they are, to be equal to sigma 1, 1, squared plus sigma 2, 2 squared minus sigma 1 multiplied by sigma 2. And I can copy and paste that information all the way. Right here. Of course, I have to take the whole square root of that. <coughs> hmm. So I look at that, I see a lot of 50s. I'm going to reduce the number of decimal points. It's carrying around to 2 because I'm looking at the resultant stress. And what I find is that every single stress state gives me the same yield criteria. This is the one Mises yield criteria in 2D world. Sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared minus sigma 1 sigma 2 raised to the power 0 0.5. So what it's telling me is that every single point lied on the von Mises yield surface. In fact, if I compare these numbers that I obtained with the original S Mises that I had pulled out, let me pull, take that. I had pulled out S Mises, remember, as the results. Take a look at it. The numbers are identical. So it was already doing this calculation internally and telling me that, would you like to know the one Mises stress? And if you do, the values are as follows. But in this case, I have gone and done a calculation of my own, and therefore I'll highlight it so I remember that this is a number that I calculated using the values of S11 and S22. And since these are also the principal stresses, if I plot them with respect to each other, they should define what would be the von Mises ellipse. So let's take a look at that.
And there we go. This is the plot that we'd already looked at, but now we're looking at it again. And this is a plot that we've generated in Excel and it's plotting S11 versus S22 and it's moving entirely on the von Mises ellipse. I wish I could have more data points that would complete this ellipse and I can do that. I can do that. What I would need to do is instead of stretching it, what we did uh, in this analysis was that in step one, we took it to 50 KSI and then in, in the second step, we stretched it biaxially. Instead of stretching it biaxially, I can make it move in the negative quadrant if I stretch it in one direction and push it in the other direction. That will help me plot out more of the ellipse if I would like to do that. And I'll do that analysis in the, in the next step so I can look at all of that data as well. But this is very promising. It shows me that the data point is always moving on the von Mises ellipse as one would have expected. But I'm also interested right now, let me move this uh, chart out of the way. But I'm also interested in looking at the Prandtl-Royce or the plastic strain increment relations. So in order to do that, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to calculate <coughs> the incremental plastic strain at each step. How would I calculate the incremental plastic strain? If I wanted DEP11, D epsilon plastic 11, it would always be equal to the next state minus the previous state. And I could write out the incremental plastic strain for each of the steps. That's the value of DEP11. I can check it's always equal to the current value minus the previous. So in every increment, the incremental plastic strain has now been uh, identified as DEP11. I've taken the data for total PE11 and calculated DEP11. Similarly, I can get the incremental plastic strain DEP22. It will uh, be equal to There we go. That's the incremental plastic strain DEP22. At every step, it is equal to the value in the previous step, uh, the value in the current step minus the previous step. All right. So just because I've done these calculations by myself, I want to make sure that I don't uh, get confused. I'm identifying that these are the values that I have obtained. Now, remember, this was S11 and S22. Now, S11 and S22 are not the deviatoric stress components. In this case, they were the stresses that were obtained from the analysis. If I wanted to calculate the deviatoric stress component, I would have to first calculate, what would I have to calculate? I would have to calculate the pressure or the hydrostatic stress. How would I do that? I would do that by calculating this plus this divided by 3. Remember, it's a plain stress problem, so sigma 3, 3 will be equal to 0. So this is the hydrostatic pressure, you could say it's the mean stress, there are different ways to call it, but it is in the end the first invariant of the stress tensor divided by 3. Or you could say the mean stress. So I've obtained that in this column. Again, this is a calculation that we've performed. Now if I wanted to pick out the deviatoric stresses, they would be equal to see the deviatoric stress s11 would be equal to sigma 11 minus the mean stress that's my deviatoric stress s11 wow that was not difficult and if i wanted the deviatoric stress s22 that would be equal to sigma 2 to output from the analysis minus the pressure. So now what I've done is I've pulled out the individual deviatoric stresses by calculating the pressure from the output from the analysis. And what was the Prandtl-Royce relationship? The Prandtl-Royce relationship said that d epsilon EP11 is equal to d epsilon EP22 divided by S22. The ratio of d epsilon EP11 divided by the deviatoric stress, so EP11 divided by if the Prandtl-Royce relationships have been followed, 
then these two ratios should be equal to each other. All right. <clears throat> if that's the case, then this will be equal to this number divided by S11. Of course, that's going to give me a division by zero to begin with. But later on, I'll get the data that I need. And this will be equal to the incremental plastic strain 2,2 2 divided by the deviatoric stress S2,2. Hmm. This is very interesting. I've gone and now pulled out the incremental plastic strain. According to the flow rule, the incremental plastic strain divided by the deviatoric stress component in that direction are going to be equal. And that's what we are looking at here. Are they equal? Well, I don't know. Let's take a look at the numbers. They seem to be really close. In fact, if I were to calculate the ratio of the two, if I were to say, take H divided by I, trying to now check whether that parental royce relationship was followed. So I'm looking at the ratio of the quantities, and they had better be equal to 1 or very close to 1. So that will be <coughs> So look at that. 